Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. With less than two weeks to go until the election, Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka and Minority Leader Susan Kent lay out their caucus priorities as they vie for control of the Minnesota Senate. Plus, highlights of the debate over the 2020 bonding bill. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. All 201 legislative seats are up for grabs on the November ballot, and the results of the election will determine how the state handles redistricting, the COVID-19 response, and the looming budget deficit. This week, House and Senate Republicans outlined their contract to open up Minnesota. Every Minnesota student deserves a quality education. It's absolutely essential for them that they have that, that and the, for most of them, it's kids in school. Number two, Every Minnesota student has the right to participate in the activities that are available in school. Number three, uh, the parents and the friends get to go to those activities. That's part of the experience that they benefit from. Four is that we want to make sure that people are able to go to their places of worship. We think that that's important uh, for many, many, many people in Minnesota. And five, restaurants and other venues need to be open and figure out what how do they open, how do they do this safely? Every one of these we believe we can do safely, but as we think about it, think about the fact that we now trust Minnesotans to look at the data, look at the science, follow the CDC guidelines, and live their lives in all of these different areas. I think we can all agree that uh, students get the best education when they're in a classroom with a teacher. Uh, we do understand there may be exceptions to that, but unfortunately under the governor's current plan, um, his default is uh, a virtual uh, distance learning situation. Um, and with the challenges that many of our students face uh, in their homes, in their communities, uh, with lack of internet and lack of resources, uh, parents are not teachers um, and they cannot be uh, expected to uh, you know, educate their kids in the same way that we're paying teachers to do. Uh, our teachers are every bit as essential as our frontline workers, um, as our waiters and waitresses, and the many other people who in Minnesota are considered essential. Um, we believe the default in the state should be every student should have a right to be in a classroom. I truly believe that uh, the Senate Republicans will keep the majority and the House will come back to Republicans because I think people want us to work together. I think that's an important issue and I think they want their kids back in school and life uh, managed through COVID but trying to live as normal as possible. And a few months ago, the House and Senate DFL unveiled their updated Minnesota Values Project. You know, when we went out and we talked to Minnesotans, uh, one of the things that, that really stood out across the state, across geographic divides, all kinds of people in, in the state, they want a good life for themselves and their families, but they really want their neighbors to do well as well. And the pandemic has really laid bare the vast inequalities in our society and the murder of George Floyd and the civil unrest that followed put really an exclamation point on that. There, for too long, we've had too much of a divide here in Minnesota, and as the governor has, has stated, it's a great place to live if you're white, and it's time for us to close those gaps. Well, we've made some progress on some issues. We know there's a lot more work to be done. We have to build a public safety system, an education system, employment numbers, housing numbers, where everyone's succeeding at the same rate. In the middle of this global pandemic, we have seen Minnesotans across the state come together to build a better future for all. From checking in on our neighbors, to raising our voices to protest injustice, to working in the front lines in healthcare and our grocery stores. That's why we are building a coalition across race, place and faith to ensure that all Minnesotans have the care they need, a clean energy future, safe communities and a fair justice system. Working together, we can strengthen our communities by improving education, making affordable health care a reality, and increasing economic prosperity for all Minnesotans. In this work of building together, we are stronger. We are building a long-lasting movement that puts Minnesotans and their priorities before division and cynicism.
The Senate Republicans currently hold a three-vote majority. It is Majority Leader Paul Gazelka's job to keep control of the Senate. I spoke with him in late summer about the priorities of his caucus. The most pressing concern for lawmakers before priorities and policies is the projected budget deficit facing the state. The latest numbers from Minnesota Management and Budget show that expenditures are expected to exceed revenues by $4.7 billion in the next biennium. How does this information shape caucus priorities? Well, it's actually alarming because uh, you have to add to that the shortfall that we have right now, and it's actually over $6 billion when you, when you do it that way. And so it, it should remind everyone, so the legislative branch and the executive branch, that you have to tighten your belt. I mean, I, I was through one of these in 2011, and it's extremely difficult. And so, you know, we'll be looking at, frankly, how, do we, how are we more efficient with what we do in government? Tax cuts are often a priority for your caucus. Are tax cuts off the table because of the projected budget deficit? Well, I think tax cuts stimulate an economy, but you know, one thing, frankly, we've been looking at right now is something called Section 179. It helps the ag community and small businesses to deduct expenses up front. That's the kind of thing that we should still be looking at so that they, you know, they, they invest more, which means they create more jobs and more opportunities. So they're not off the table, no. Okay. Um, your caucus in the last few years tackled housing affordability, looking for ways to roll back unnecessary regulations and to improve home ownership. Because of the pandemic and related job losses, one could argue that affordable housing is more important than ever before. Are there ways, despite the budget shortfall, to increase housing affordability? You know, the simplest thing is, is not to over-regulate, and that's all housing. That's the small house and the big house. You know, I've been to other states, and I can't, I can't believe how inexpensive a home is there versus Minnesota. And so we have to look at what are the things that we regulate. I know compared to Wisconsin, our cost to build is dramatically higher. And so this is the time that we should now be looking at that. You know, and we also have been doing housing bonds to help create more affordable housing. But the biggest thing I think we could do long term is, is to correct the overregulation. Addressing the high cost of health care and prescription drugs has also been a priority for your caucus. Uh, does it remain so? And in what areas might there be further improvement? Yeah, this is one that I think will be around for a long time. You know, reinsurance was something that we did that allow, allowed us to stabilize the health insurance market in Minnesota. We now have the lowest cost for health insurance premium around the country. Uh, think about what we did for insulin, that we provided emergency fly, supplies for that. Uh, we reformed the benefit manager, that's the middleman on prescriptions to, to be more accountable. Uh, its work is never done on this, uh, but what we won't do is we won't go to uh, one care is what the governor calls it for, for Medicare for all or some form of completely government run health care. We don't think that's the direction, but we have to bring more competition uh, and more innovation because this is a, a major expense for most families. And how has COVID-19 shaped your views on health care? And, and has it? Has it at all? Yeah, one silver lining is we do way more telemedicine. We do more, way more Zoom calls. Uh, and that has, is, will help drive down the cost of insurance, uh, but it will also make medical care more accessible everywhere. And so we're all figuring that out, but with the, the technology and the cameras that, that film so accurately now, we really can do a lot with telemedicine and we, we uh, made it easier because of COVID. That was a, a national drive, but it really has helped in Minnesota. Um, as you know, child care providers were already struggling, um, particularly in rural areas before COVID-19. Since COVID-19, uh, I imagine it's, it's even more challenging. Can the legislature do more to assist child care providers, especially in those rural areas where services have been difficult to attain? Yes, and a lot of that has to do with making it very difficult for the small mom pod a daycare provider. Uh, we've put on so many regulations. Again, regulations in Minnesota have crippled their ability to function. So many people just said, it's not worth it. I don't want to do it. So that's a big area that we can help. We did uh, listening groups all across the state, and that was probably the number one issue they talked about is you make it so difficult 
for us to be able to watch our neighbor's kids while they're working or doing whatever else they're doing. So that's probably number one. We do need to crack down and we did on, on the fraud. You heard the child's care assistance program where there was an abuse of that. We, we made good progress there, but you know, those two things uh, are, are things that we've done and I think we'll continue to work on this area because it's a very, very important need for many families. This fall, under guidelines sent by the Minnesota Health Department, school districts will open in a variety of ways depending on you know, the level of infection with the coronavirus. There's in-person, there's a hybrid approach, and then there's also distance-only learning. Potentially this fall, more and more schools may have to go to the distance-only model due to the coronavirus. Education spending is already a significant portion of the state budget. Will schools have the support, both financially and in terms of infrastructure, that they need in order to educate kids as we continue in this uncertain time? Well, first of all, I think it's a big mistake that we are setting up a system that many high schools in particular aren't going to be able to have their kids in, in school. Uh, school is essential for our kids, and I think it's like one person under age 20 has died from COVID in Minnesota. It's not a problem for our kids, and, but, but not getting a good education is a major problem for our kids. And so I'm going to continue to push to get all kids back in school, but with the, the, uh, the metrics that they have put out there, it's almost impossible for many schools to have a high school. And so, and I think COVID cases will rise in the fall. That's sort of what happens with other viruses. And if that happens and all the schools are shut down again, our kids will fall behind. So that's number one is we got to get kids back in school. There's no other option that I see as acceptable. And then as far as resources and, and, and how we fund that, we have put in large amounts of, of dollars for education over the last number of years. Uh, when we, we're going to have an economic downturn, we're all going to have to figure out how to live with the resources that we have, and that will be tough. This next year will be very, very difficult. If we're $6 billion short or $8 billion or whatever the number, it will be a very challenging year. Um, the legislature recently passed a police reform bill to improve accountability in policing and hopefully to prevent another death like that of George Floyd. Are there other areas in the criminal justice system that require reform? You know, we're, I, I said that we would keep an open mind and, and look at uh, any of the issues that we couldn't get to during this uh, uh, police accountability bill that we passed. And so we'll do hearings on some of those other issues. Uh, but I, I am proud of the bill that we actually did. Uh, all of the groups came together in the end and said, this is good. All of them. Uh, some said it was not enough, but but it was something that we were, were very proud of. Uh, and, and at the same time, we, we did not, uh, um, we, we felt like the police were doing a good job, but that we had to figure out a way to uh, pluck out a bad apple here or there. We needed to make sure that we had more citizen input. We really wanted them to have input, but we still wanted the police to run the, the police board, not somebody else. And so uh, it, it was very, very good, but it's, it's in fact amazing how much we got done in the special session. But you know, we're, we're not done there. We'll do the hearings and see if we have more to do. And finally, before we go, as you know, the Department of Corrections recently announced the closure of two small correctional facilities to help address a budget shortfall. Is this a good move? And is this the kind of budget trimming that may be necessary to have that balanced budget in the next biennium? So this, I think, was the first one that they actually did to reduce spending. It probably would have been the last one for us. We just feel like public safety is, is, is the most important of all the things that we can do. Uh, back in April, I said that the, the governor should be cutting each agency 5%. If you go back to 2011, when we had a shortfall, they all did that internally because they knew they had to do it. They didn't tell us where they were saving the money. They just did. Had we done that, we would save $100 million every month. And so think about from April the next year, that's a, you know, a billion dollars or more that we could have saved. Other states have been doing this. Other states have cut five to 10% off of every agency. Why we have not, uh, I don't have an answer for, but as we're moving into next year and we get the numbers, that's we'll, we'll see where we're gonna be. The other big disappointment is, disappointment is man management and budget said that they were gonna do a forecast in August to take another snapshot about where we are, are we, how bad is it? 
Well, they've decided not to do that now. And I don't know if that means it's really bad or, you know, we'll see. But the next snapshot, if they don't change that position, is in November. And, and we'll see. But I, I, I do expect it to be difficult. And that's why I, I wish the, the government, governor and his agencies would all reduce spending 5% now. Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka, it's always so nice to talk to you. Thank you for your time today. You bet. Senate Minority Leader Susan Kent was recently elected to lead the DFL caucus. She is now charged with securing majority control of the Senate. In August, she joined me to talk about the DFL priorities. Here's our conversation. The budget news is grim. Uh, the latest from Minnesota management and budget is that expenditures are expected to exceed revenues by $4.7 billion for the next biennium. How will that shape DFL priorities for the remainder of 2020 and into 2021? Uh, hi, Shannon. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, we have known, we have been talking to MMB and looking at these projections, and we have known that the economic hit to our economy and our state and our families and our businesses is, is significant, and this is not um, unexpected. Um, it's caused by the virus and the fact that we've had a lot of people lose jobs and, and had their work and their pay curtailed. And, um, you know, it is, it is having a definite economic impact. Um, the, in the ideal world, um, uh, the federal government, frankly, would do a lot more to support Minnesotans and Americans across the country, our small businesses, because we know that if we can support all these entities through the virus, um, then we'll be in a much better position to come back strong. Um, I will also say that, um, that you know, being able to uh, contain the virus allows our businesses to stay open, um, allows people to get back to work better. Um, and so the more we can do to support those efforts to prop up the economy while we're de dealing with the reality of the virus, um, that'll just help us. But the challenge is, um, you know, at the, at the state level, we cannot deficit spend. Um, that is why we are so reliant on the federal government to do that. We have made significant efforts here in the state um, I'm really grateful for Governor Walls' leadership throughout this. Um, the legislature has partnered, I think, relatively successfully through most of it. Um, but um, it, this is a serious issue, and it's going to and it's going to take very serious solutions as we as we move ahead. But hopefully, we can keep things from being worse than they have to be. The coronavirus pandemic is highlighting discrepancies in many areas, including education, healthcare, housing, and employment. I'd like to begin with healthcare. The Minnesota DFL Values Project, which is a governing initiative jointly through the House and Senate DFL caucuses, is stating that all Minnesotans should have, quote, the care that they need. What does that mean? That means that everybody should be able to afford good health care. Um, have quality health care, have uh, uh, prescription drugs that aren't um, overcharged um, to, to profit and benefit the big pharmaceutical companies. Um, we need to focus, and this goes back to the question of the values and what this is with the values of the Minnesota Values Project and the values of the DFL as we approach all of these challenges. Um, we need to put people first. We need to put the interests of our neighbors, of each other, our families um, at first and support them uh, to make sure that they have the tools to be able to work hard and contribute and get a good education and have a, a decent place to live so that they can so that we can have a thriving society and economy. The um, as you know, education is the second largest area in in budget expenditures for the state of Minnesota. And right now, education is not functioning normally um, because of the pandemic. Despite the challenge, of that, the projected deficit, your caucus wants to fully fund public education and provide affordable childcare and support job training and, and support higher education. Is that simply aspirational or is there a way to actually do that? I think it's important to realize that these conversations definitely predate COVID. Um, in terms of making sure that we're fully supporting our educational system, both from our K-12 schools all the way through um, higher education and career and technical training, um, this is something that is good for our people and our families. It's good for our kids. It's also good for our workforce and our society to make sure that we're training people for the workforce of tomorrow. 
These are smart things to do. We know that we have underinvested in education over several decades. This is something that I've been talking about for a while and others have as well. This is not new. We also know this is not necessarily something we can flip a switch on and it's now become more challenging because of some of the economic um, ramifications of COVID. But we have to put a plan in place. And again, it goes back to where are the priorities? The priorities are in making sure that we're not providing big tax breaks to big corporations. Um, what we ought to be doing them is doing is preparing the workforce that they need to be successful. That way it's a win-win for everybody, particularly Minnesotans. Parents and teachers are anxious about the 2020, 2020 2021 school year. Um, school districts are, have laid out a variety of plans, but should it become necessary that all schools pivot to online learning only, will there be financial support for those schools, for the infrastructure, the broadband access? Can the money be quickly gotten to the schools? And ultimately, do you fear that this next school year may just be a loss? I would say two things. First of all, I really appreciate the recommendation from Governor Walls and his team that gives flexibility for school districts to be um, adaptive to the situations that are in their communities. What, what is happening in one community may be very different than what's happening in another community and they should have that flexibility. I think we all agree that the best solution is to have kids have as much in school time as makes sense and as we can do safely, because that's what's best for their education, often for their families who need to work um, and, and rely on their kids being in school in order to do that. If kids are um, distance learning while they're supposedly earning a living, that's a really difficult spot for a lot of families. And I hear that loud and clear in my own community. Um, but we also know that districts are gonna to have to be able to adapt over time and with changing, changing circumstances. And if we end up having a really rough winter, um, you, that you make a really good point. One of the challenges is, and again, with the state not being able to deficit spend, um, and we are looking at providing additional resources to our schools so that they can step up for extra cleaning and sanitation, for example. Um, uh, that is where it would be really helpful if Congress would step up and provide the supports to our schools, um, which will allow um, uh, students to participate more in, actively in the classroom, for teachers to be there safely and to stay safe. Um, it's, it's too important that we do this. I, don't, uh, you know, I know all families, all of us, myself included, are having these conversations about the trade-offs that are inherent here. There's no way to wave a magic wand and just get kids back in the classroom and have, have everything be back to normal. We know that's just not a reality because of this virus. Um, but we need to do the best we can to support all students and to deliver an education that reaches all students because it's just too important. Changing gears a little bit, how has the death of George Floyd changed the Senate DFL caucus's approach to policing reform and racial inequity in Minnesota and does more need to be done? Um, a couple of questions in there and I will say that the Senate DFL caucus has supported um, uh, police reform and accountability for some time. So that is not new to us. This is, there is a lot of this that is not new to us. Um, what has changed is um, sort of a broader understanding, I think, real sense of urgency here, um, a real sense of urgency um, from members of law enforcement who also want to see change. Um, from certainly from people in our communities who have fully understood much better, I think, the impact of um, on communities, black communities in particular, of not feeling and being safe in their own in their own communities. Um, and in terms of moving ahead, um, yes, you know, we were able to make a good start this past special session, and I am really grateful for that. And I'm really appreciative that we were able to work on a bipartisan basis um, and everybody really come into the middle um, to get something meaningful done. But we know it's just a first step, and I am really anxious that we come back together in January and, and continue this very, very important work. And finally, prior to COVID-19, uh, affordable housing was a big issue in Minnesota. Uh, we just don't have enough of it. Now with the faltering economy, people losing their jobs, um, it's perhaps even more crucial. What does your caucus propose to help people get access to affordable housing and stay in their homes? Um, I think you and I had a conversation about this several months ago, as a matter of fact. So again, this isn't new and it's not unique to Minnesota. Um, the lack of affordable housing is a real challenge. Uh, there are a number of things we can be doing. There are things we can do um, during the 
this interim prior to session even starting. But housing infrastructure bonds, for example, we've talked about that. That is a thing, a way that we can provide um, support to um, get developers working and building that affordable housing around our communities. We had an example this winter of unveiling a senior um, residential facility here in my district and Governor Walls came out for that and it's just an example of how it's a win-win-win because you have seniors able to move into a place like that and you also free up um, housing stock for for families um, so it's just a way of keeping the whole system moving is what's really important and we know we have a number of tools available to us uh, this is an area because it's not just a Minnesota problem again I wish I wish we could have some federal responses to this this is a place where we could put people to work in an amazing way to build a lot of housing, to um, solve a whole bunch of other issues in our society by giving people some freedom to move around that they might not have had. Um, and then at the same time, um, put people to work and have, have an economic impact in that way. Senate Minority Leader Susan Kent, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Shannon. After months of uncertainty, the legislature came together during last week's fifth special session to pass an almost $1.9 billion public works infrastructure package. It's an investment in our future. It's an investment in our state. It's an investment in our people. As I was sitting here listening to the debate, I, I looked across, as we often do, the scroll around the chamber, and, and I didn't realize it until today but half of that scroll is about capital investment, I think, at least, as it says here, develop the resources of our land. That's capital investment. That's what this bill is all about, developing the resources of our land and building up its institutions, whether it's the University of Minnesota, whatever it might be, whether it's Minsky, those 57 sites around the state of Minnesota, whether it's our military readiness centers, whether it's these mental health crisis centers that I'm so fond of across the state of Minnesota that we're developing, whether it's the Minnesota Zoo, it's, it's building up our institutions. And lastly, I just read about promoting all the interests of Minnesota, the great interests. And again, Senator Bach, whether that's Lake Vermilion State Park, whether it's that trail in Winona, Senator Friends, whether that's that river, Minnesota River in Mankato, those are the great interests of our state that's what this bill is all about, making Minnesota a better place, making our people a better place, putting, putting people to work. So while there are good things in this bill, there are also decisions that were made that will make it much harder for us to balance our budget the next session. So I am voting no, not because I don't support tax relief for farmers and small businesses, not because I don't support clean water and doing the right things to maintain our buildings, have safe roads and bridges, but I'm voting no because we cannot have this bill move forward without somebody saying next year is going to be hard. And there are provisions in this bill that make it harder. us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.